Well, uh, dear friends, good morning to one and all. On behalf of the Board of Trustees uh, of the Rafael del Pino Foundation, it's a great pleasure for me to participate in this uh, opening ceremony and to welcome you to the second edition of the Central Banking Series, organized by the Global Interdependent Center, the VVVA, and the Rafael del Pino Foundation, and fostered by our mutual friend, Manuel Balmaceda, who made it possible for us to organize last year the first edition of the series in Spain and encourage the establishment of the connections between us. Well, Michael, Manuel, thank you very much for your support once again. It's a great pleasure for me and for us to host this event on this sunny day in Madrid. We ordered this beautiful day for you. <laughs> Michael, the Foundation and the VVVA are delighted to establish this partnership with the GIC, an institution with which we share the common objectives of contributing to the transmission of knowledge and to foster leadership globally. And of course, it's really an honor to have in attendance such a fine representation of the best economists and senior executives from around the world willing to share experiences and ideas in order to better understand the situation of the world economy. So thank you very much for, for being here. Let me briefly to talk uh, about our founder and the foundation to understand why we are here at the Rafael del Pino Foundation. Our founder, Rafael del Pino Moreno, was once a young entrepreneur who had to face uh, obstacles to achieve his dreams in very difficult times. Nevertheless, with effort and determination, and after 50 years of hard work, he consolidated a Spanish construction, engineering, and infrastructure company, Ferrovial, that is now one of the world leading firms in this sector. Then, at the age of 80, he decided to stop working at the company. However, his intellectual curiosity and spirit of enterprise led him in 1999 to set up the Rafael del Pino Foundation to train leaders and entrepreneurs to encourage freedom and to promote the transmission of knowledge. His idea for the foundation was to provide a forum where Spanish leaders and entrepreneurs would be able to hone their knowledge, skills and capabilities to better society in general. And that's the reason why we are here. We face new challenges in the world today we need a leadership able and willing to activate the rich dynamics of enterprise, encourage excellence and good governance in the world, thereby ensuring the creation of jobs, economic and social cohesion. When some of you visited Spain in 2015, during the first edition of the CBS, uh, um, there were forces giving the Spanish economy a favorable tailwind. You know better than I uh, which forces I'm talking about, low interest rates, exchange rates, oil prices, improvements uh, in governance and regulation, or are some of the reasons uh, for that incipient uh, recovery. One year later, the Spanish economy continues even stronger in terms of growth and job creation, but around the modest recovery of the world economy, there is uh, considerable uncertainty. Well, Anyway, we will have the opportunity during the meeting to elaborate on this and other issues and to discuss on how we can take advantage of the opportunities that are happening. But now is not the moment to go deeper on these topics. For the moment, that's all I would like to say, except to finish by once again thanking uh, Michael, Manuel, and all our friends at the VVVA and the GIC. Let me mention especially the support and leadership of our colleagues Gillian and Beatriz, and saying how delighted we are at the launch of this second edition of the CBS in partnership with the VVVA and the GIC. And last but not least, uh, uh, we appreciate all of you, speakers and participants at this event, your presence and, and support. I would like to conclude my comments uh, by wishing you a very warm welcome uh, to the meeting and to have a pleasant stay in the Rafael Pino Foundation and in Madrid. Thank you very much. Michael Drury, please, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. Uh, it's, a, it's a pleasure to be here in Madrid. For some of us, the second time, unfortunately, I was not able to be here last year. So this is my first time in Madrid. And I must say I'm extraordinarily pleased with both the city and, and the turnout. The, uh, this is a beautiful room, this uh, wonderful place to have a, a meeting. Uh, we came uh, to Ireland on Thursday and Friday uh, before we came here. And I think this was a, a fitting combination because Ireland and Spain seem to be 
the two parts of Europe that are working their way towards reform most quickly and offer the greatest promise. And one of the things we want to discuss as we're here today is how much of that is unique to the local economies and how much of that is transferable ideas that are going to spread through Europe. So what is the level of optimism that we in the United States should have about Europe and at the same time an open discussion of what we think is going on in the United States? Uh, at its heart, the Global Interdependence Center is a social network, uh, bringing together people who have a common interest in learning and understanding more about the things that make us all work together around the world. We hope that this fosters greater participation, and we hope that it leads to increased trade, to greater understanding between countries. But for us, the most important thing is to have the debate, not to tell us which side of the debate to be on. So we hope for an open discussion today. Uh, each one of the speakers will talk for you know, 20 minutes or so, and then we'll leave time for questions. Uh, we hope that we have an interesting social interaction. Uh, I will introduce our first panel, uh, Anthony Murphy, uh, policy advisor and senior economist with the Federal Reserve Bank of Dallas. And then we'll have Bill Strauss, who was here last year from the uh, Central Bank of uh, the Federal Reserve Bank of Chicago. Uh, each one will speak for about 20 minutes. And uh, after Anthony's finished, I'll have time for maybe one or two questions while we're doing some transition on the, on the technology. Uh, always technology problems, right? <laughs> <laughs> and then Bill will go. And when Bill's done, we'll you know, give him a couple of questions. And then we'll see if we have time to open it up to both. All right, Anthony, please. Um, I'm speaking here on my own behalf, and I'm not speaking for the Federal Reserve Bank of Dallas or the Federal Reserve System, so I always have to say this. And as you may recognize, I'm Irish, and uh, I've been in the Fed system six years, which is a little bit unusual. And I go to my first FOMC meeting next month, for what it's worth. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit about the uh, U.S. economy, and um, if I can manage this. Yes, sorry. Sorry. You have to put the mouse. Okay. Sorry. No. Is it on? You should be on. It was on a minute ago. She's the PDF. Just two seconds. No, it's not connected. Yeah. Okay. Okay, the Fed is a very similar remit to the ECB, except we have a dual mandate in the US. So we're concerned with price stability and maximum employment which I think changes things a little bit relative to the ECB. So I'm going to talk about the US economic outlook and some longer term aspects of US monetary policy. Uh, Bill has a little bit more freedom than I have, so he may be able to talk a little bit about some of the uh, more pressing issues. It's, but I was told to uh, confine myself to certain items and uh, not talk about other items. So. I can also discuss what I think are some of the limits of monetary policy. I think um, in the US, the Fed has gone a long way, and probably the, the ball is in the court of politicians going forward in terms of sustaining the economic recovery in the US. Okay. If we look at uh, the, what's happened over the past few years, GDP growth has gone up from 1.6 to 2.2, 1.7, 2.4, 2.6, 2 and so on. So growth has been pretty modest, and it's been pretty uneven. And particularly the first half of this year, growth has been pretty low, but we think that's unusual. We expect growth to be higher in the second half of the year. So in the first half of the year, we had um, a hit from energy oil and gas investment and in the second or in the first quarters and in the second quarter and also with a very negative hit from inventories in the second quarter. But going forward we expect things to improve a little bit. 
just to give you an idea of the size, you can't see it terribly well, but on this slide, which you can probably pick up afterwards, try to isolate the effect of oil and gas mining um, investment in the US. The red line at the bottom shows what happened to oil and gas related investment. And you can see with the fall in oil prices, there is a very dramatic drop in oil and gas related investment and that dragged down overall invest business investment. Business investment was soft in any case, but oil and gas was the thing that really dragged it down. In terms of the bright spots on the US economy, I think consumer expenditure has been pretty bright. P we call it PCE, personal consumer expenditure. And it's been pretty bright for a number of reasons. One, interest rates are low. Two, the labor market has been improving. Personal incomes are improving. And also our general view is that deleveraging paying down debt has largely completed in the US as far as uh, the household sector is concerned. So PCE, personal consumer expenditure, has been strong and we expect it to be strong going forward in terms of fundamentals. You can see on this chart, um, the red line shows the overall level of household net worth relative to income. And you can see it's very variable. There's a combination of housing and uh, equity prices, the stock market and so on effects in there. So housing wealth collapsed in 2007, 2008. So household wealth fell dramatically. And then from about 2012 onwards, household wealth has crept up. And relative to income, it's almost back to where it was in the peaks of the mid 2000s. So in, if you believe in a sort of traditional consumption function where consumption is determined by income, permanent income, and something like a wealth to income ratio, all of those factors are very strong. For, and that's why we believe the outlook for consumer spending is very strong. The blue line shows you the level of debt to income, household debt to income. And you can see household debt to income peaked at around 130% of income in 2007 or so. The fall in the household debt to income was part of it was uh, forced on households, if you like. We think about two thirds of that fall was due to foreclosures and write-offs. And one third was people paying down their debt or reducing their mortgage debt. But that sort of deleveraging appears to be pretty complete. Okay, looking at the labor market, um, we can look at, sorry, I have two s slides up here. The headline unemployment rate is the so-called U-tree unemployment rate, which is the exact same unemployment rate as you have over here. It's measured in the same way. And you can see the unemployment rate is pretty close now to any measure of the natural rate or the NIRU. So the US economy is pretty close to full employment at the moment. Estimates of the NIRU are in the range 4.8 to 5%, and the unemployment rate now is about 4.9%. People talk about sort of disguised unemployment. Well, the U6, a broad measure of unemployment, gets at that issue. U6 includes uh, part-time for economic reasons and discouraged workers. People are marginally attached to the labor market. And you can see, that you see the same trends. There's been a fairly consistent fall in headline unemployment and this broader measure of unemployment that people talk about. Very often you can see comments about the US, unemployment has fallen for the wrong reasons. Unemployment has fallen because possibly labor force participation has fallen or because there's lots of people working part-time for economic reasons. But the, across the board, the labor market, certainly on the quantity side, is pretty strong. So the next slide is to do with uh, labor force participation. So the blue line shows labor force participation rates in the US. You can see they've been falling over this whole period from 2000. 
a lot of that has to do with the demographics. The baby boomers are reaching retirement age and they're retiring. Younger people enter the labour market a lot later and so on. So um, one of the nice things that's happened recently is the labour force participation ratio has levelled off and slightly ticked up. When people discuss labour force participation, they sort of split it up into demographic and cyclical effects. And depending on which side of the, the fence you lie on in terms of policy, some people say all of the decline in the labour force participation rate is demographic. It's to do with ageing. Some people say it's all to do with cyclical factors. But actually, maybe 40 to 50% is demographic. At the moment, 10 or 12%, 10% or something is cyclical. And there's a bit that's some sort of secular trends that are, we can't explain terribly well. Some people say this is all to do with the, there's a lot of hidden unemployment out there because labour force participation is, has fallen so much. But I, I'm a bit sceptical of that viewpoint. There is some cyclical element there, but not that much at this stage, in my view. Sorry. Okay. You probably can't read this. It's a little small. We have one of the strange things when I started working on the US is how bad our measures of sort of underlying wage inflation are. There's various measures out there. So we've average hourly earnings. Average hourly earnings is a real mixture. So it doesn't control for composition effects or anything like that. It's not, uh, it's not terribly good. So average hourly earnings is the top chart on the left-hand side. And you can see there hasn't been a little bit of, there's been a slight bit of action in the past few quarters, average hourly earnings are now around two point, they're rising around 2.6%. Um, or average hourly earnings are rising 2.5%. Average, I'm short-sighted, average hourly earnings are on the right-hand side at the top. The employment cost index is on the left-hand side, that's rising about 26 but both of these aren't possibly, they possibly aren't the greatest measure of sort of wage pressure in the US. The one I sort of like, and a lot of people like nowadays, is the Atlanta Fed wage tracker. So this is tracking the same people a year apart in time. So you're taking account of the fact that older people on higher wages are retiring, and younger people or people who are out of the labour force are coming in and they're starting off on lower wages. So you're trying to capture people who've been in the labour force continually. And for that group of individuals who've been in the labour force continually, their wages are going up by three, three and a third percent, 3.3 percent at the moment. So that's the bottom chart uh, there the Atlanta Fed wage tracker, and that shows much stronger wage developments than the other two charts. And we think that's probably a better indication of some of the pressures in the labour market. But on the whole, we have to say wage inflation has only slowly picked up this time around. Okay, we can come to forecasts, and I'm always a little sceptical about forecasts because if you have to submit forecasts on a regular basis, you're always wrong, and sometimes you're significantly wrong. So what are the, the forecasts for output growth? I've given three lots of forecasts. The FOMC is the most recent one. The blue chip and the SPF are consensus forecasts by polling a group of economists, maybe 30 or 40 economists, but they're slightly out of date or a little staler than the FOMC. In terms of the FOMC, it's sort of seen growth on an annual base around 2%. It's a, their forecasts are a little less optimistic than the forecasts of private sector forecasters. But it's pretty much the, the bottom line is moderate output growth going forward over the next couple of years. And in terms of unemployment, if we think the Nairu is around 4.8%, we're seeing unemployment fall below the Nairu, the natural rate, and stay there for the next couple of years. 
So we've a fairly strong labor market and moderate output growth. So obviously productivity, labor productivity isn't doing anything dramatic. We have to be a little bit skeptical about short-term forecasts for the, I'm sorry, my, um, this mouse is playing up. Here we go. Every time when we, with all of the models we have, every forecast we produce at any point in time always is pretty mean reverting. So we're always going back to what we think the long-term forecast of growth and our capacity to forecast short-term growth developments isn't all that great. So what I've shown here is the final GDP growth rates, the latest GDP growth rates in black, and then forecasts at various points in time. So I've taken the March forecasts from various blue chip economic indicators. So the dashed lines show the forecasts at various points in time, and they're all pretty much, let's revert to trend pretty quickly. So these economic forecasts, they're the best we have, but they are very uncertain. If we're to talk about a mean squared forecast error, a sort of 95% confidence interval is 2% plus or minus 0 to 4% two years uh, a year out. So our forecast or margins of error are very wide, but these are the best we can come up with at the moment. In terms of the labour market, everyone has, almost everyone has been under predicting the fall in unemployment rate. You can see the dotted forecast there, they all fall, they're all much higher than the actual uh, outturns. I wonder whether going forward that will continue to be the case because recently we've seen some more people being drawn back into the labour force. So we may not see the sharp fall in the unemployment rate that a lot of people foresee. There may be a pickup, a further pickup in labour force participation. And then in terms of inflation, we have a 2% target. We don't look at headline inflation because it's affected by energy and food prices. So headline inflation is that blue line that wiggles around quite significantly. And you can see in the past couple of years, headline inflation has come down quite a bit because of the fall in energy prices and because of the fall in healthcare costs, which in the case of healthcare costs, there's a little bit of a debate about whether some of the fall in costs there are a permanent feature or a temporary feature of various changes in the sort of operating procedures and so on. The more, the better indicators of inflation are either trim mean inflation, which the Dallas Fed produces, or core inflation. Core inflation excludes food and energy. And both of those measures are closer to 2%. And our best forecast of where inflation will, so we're still a little bit below our 2% target, but we're getting close to that target. If another issue in terms of inflation, well, what about long-term inflation expectations? Are they anch well anchored or not? And on the whole, they're fairly well anchored. Consumer expectation inflations five to 10 years ahead are shown in green. They're around 2.5%. They've fallen a little, a little, but they're still in a reasonable range. And then the SPF uh, forecasters expected CPI inflation is around 2.1, 2% in the long term. So again, it's reasonably, well ex it's reasonably well anchored. So the Fed has always said, we're looking at where inflation will be and whether long-term inflation where we think inflation will be in the future. Trend mean or uh, core PC inflation are good indicators of future inflation. And they all, the Fed has also said it's concerned about whether inflation expectations are anchored. And they appear to be anchored and inflation appears to be moving towards its target. There is one unusual aspect of this. Survey-based measures of inflation 
are close to, are very different from market-based expectations. So expectations based on tips, they're much lower and there's an issue with liquidity and the like. So I wouldn't place too much emphasis on market-based measures of inflation as opposed to survey-based measures. I think survey-based measures are the things we should be focusing on. And just to see the forecast of inflation, as you'd expect, inflation is converging on 2% over the next one to two years. Okay, in terms of monetary policy, what has the Fed said? It said the case, its the most recent statement was the case for an increase in the federal funds rate has strengthened. So, Lord, let me not sin, but let it be in the future. Not today. The, the whole issue is soon, but not now. So in terms of int interest raising interest rates, the next possible hike in interest rate, the Fed is saying, or the FOMC is saying, the case for an increase in the Fed's funds rate is much stronger now than in the past, but it's decided to hold off for the moment, awaiting further evidence. So this is data-based evidence as opposed to date-based, a date-based criterion. And then in terms of the risks, it's talked about the near-term risks to the economic outlook being roughly balanced. And my reading of that is most of the risks are external as opposed to domestic. So the risks are the standard risks, uh, continuing slow growth in Europe, maybe further Brexit-type situations with other countries in Europe, slow growth in China, uh, debt problems in China, and so on. So these, the Fed is close to raising rates again at some point. I, uh, the ECB, I think, is in a completely different situation. And as far as I can read it, there's no likelihood of them um, rich, raising rates at all. And there's calls for, for, in some cases, there's calls for further monetary accommodation in Europe. And it's sort of strange, the underlying, the way I see it as a looking from the US, the underlying problems of the Eurozone seem to remain. We know it's not, the Eurozone is not close to being a, an optimal currency union, whereas the US is. There's no fiscal union, so adjustment costs are very unevenly distributed amongst member states, which is less the case in the US. And then supply side reforms are being very, very slow. And my last slide touches on some longer term issues in the US in terms of uh, policy. One of the issues is that uh, almost everyone has lowered their estimates of growth going forward. So we're seeing people are forecasting lower output growth and lower productivity growth in the long term. And obviously, if we have a low growth rate, that's going to lead to a lower natural rate of interest. And also, one of the issues is that the zero lower bound will be more likely in the case of a recession. So how come uh, we're seeing a slower growth? It's a combination of um, changing demographics. We've seen less capital deepening this time round, and total factor productivity is a good deal, but has been a good deal lower this time around. If we look at micro data in terms of total factor productivity, we're seeing widening gaps between the most and least productive firms. We're seeing fewer startups and re re less reallocation of production amongst firms. And obviously, aging demographics matter in terms of the level of government debt. So there is an entitlement issue that politicians have, they've kicked that can down the road, but it's, it's a, an issue that will arise again in the future. In the circumstances, I, my feeling is there's a pretty limited role for monetary policy or short-term fiscal policy in addressing these issues. The Fed can only do so much. Um, in terms of the long term, there's a role for macro pro policies, but if macro pro policies are excessive, then you um, you hinder financial intermediation, so there are trade-offs in terms of macro-proof policies. 
And really, we're talking about su sensible supply-side policies. And sensible supply-side policies are largely within the remit of Congress and are not within the remit of the Fed. Just to give you an idea, I skipped some of these things because I've gone over time. Here's some indication of our estimates of the long-term growth rate. And they come from various people. So since 2000, forecasters have generally reduced reduced their estimates of the growth rate, say in the case of the blue chip, from 3.1% to 2.1%. So that's a combination of demographics and lower productivity going forward. In the case of the CBO Congressional Budget Office, it's gone down from 2.9% to 1.9%. And in the case of the Fed, who in my view, have been more pessimistic, or the FOMC, have been more pessimistic than everyone else. You can see their estimate of long-term growth rate has gone down in the past six years from 2.7% to 1.8%. And in fact, in between the June FOMC meeting and the September FOMC meeting, they reduced their estimate of long-term growth rate from 2% to 1.8%. So they're very pessimistic. Well, in my view, quite pessimistic, pessimistic about the outlook for TFP going forward. Okay. Um, I'm uh, I'm leave it there. I'll okay. let you take over. Right. So we need to switch over. So if we have a question, yeah. Do we have one quick question here from Chris? Anthony, you're relatively new to the, the Fed system. Hit the Chris button. Oh, oh, I'm sorry. Uh, Anthony, you're relatively new to the Fed system. Uh, remind all of us why the Fed doesn't include asset prices in inflation, particularly commercial and residential real estate, which are two areas where I work. It's tens of trillions of dollars for the assets and credit, but somehow it's not seen as important. Why does it include it explicitly? The Fed has a role in terms of financial stability. So one of the issues in recent times, uh, one of the cases for raising rates that people have put forward, some members of the FMC have put forward is CRE. And they're concerned about a little bit of exuberance in the CRE market, commercial real estate market. But uh, I think the sort of, well, the rhetoric we saw before the financial crisis was that um, housing, uh, residential asset price and commercial real estate prices weren't, uh, the Fed was exclusively focused on its mandate and they weren't a good indicator, necessarily a good indicator of future growth or future inflation. I agree they're not a great indicator of inflation because in the build-up to the financial crisis, inflation appeared to be under control, but CRE and residential prices were going crazy. In terms of the risks to growth, um, the argument is the old argument that Greenspan and Bernanke have come up with. It's, uh, it's very difficult to tell what a bubble is and we will deal with the consequences after and maybe we've put in place uh, stress tests and so on have protected the key elements of the financial system from likely uh, CRE and real estate related crashes. Now that's a, that's a value judgment in my opinion and people have different views about that. Okay. So, uh, buenos dias. I'm happy to join you uh, for a second time. Uh, and um, unlike my colleague, uh, Anthony, who's been there for six years at the Dallas Fed, I've been with the Chicago Fed for 35 years. And maybe that uh, duration has made me a little bit more willing to uh, take some risk and uh, uh, take the heat in case uh, uh, I say some things that uh, we maybe are not supposed to be getting so much. We're a little more liberal on that. Um, 
And in fact, our president of the Chicago Fed, Charlie Evans, will be speaking in Australia in a couple of days. Hopefully, my comments are not too dissimilar uh, from his point of view. I think we're, we're, we see things eye to eye for the most part. Um, and I'm also pleased to say that uh, these slides have been updated so they'll be slightly different from your handout copies with the most recent GDP and the uh, personal income data that came out on Friday. They will be posted on the GIC website. And I'm also pleased to say that when we have the third annual uh, Madrid Central Banking Series, uh, Charlie Evans has agreed to join you. So uh, you'll get a chance to actually uh, ask him more direct questions with regard to the Chicago view. So um, what I want to do is kind of just share a little bit of this view that we have, again, ma mainly of the Chicago Fed view. I thought uh, when Anthony was first in the program, uh, for the most part, uh, each of the Reserve Bank presidents have different views, and certainly uh, we have a very different view than the Dallas Fed uh, in general, although that seems to might be changing a bit, it sounds like. Um, so how are we doing with regard to the economy? Uh, you know, you look at the U.S. economy, and the last three quarters of growth have been pretty subpar. Year-over-year uh, -year growth has come in at 1.3%. This is well below what we think of as trend growth for the U.S. economy, which the, as, as, as Anthony mentioned, the FOMC, the central tendency, thinks of between 1.7, 2.0 uh, for that growth rate. So it's been uh, quite disappointing for the last three quarters. In particular, those of you who follow the uh, U.S. GDP, there was a great hope for the second quarter. In fact, most of the now castings uh, that were putting put out during most of the second quarter, in fact, all the way up till the end of the uh, end of July, right before the release of second quarter GDP, was anticipating a number that was going to be around two and a half percent. And it was only with a few days before the release that those numbers seemed to go a little softer. Uh, quite frankly, I was using a different indicator to give me a much more sour view, much lower view with GDP. And that is what we produce at the Chicago Fed, known as a National Activity Index. Uh, this is a one-off indicator which kind of gives us on a higher frequency basis monthly uh, how the U.S. economy is doing regarding its trend. That black line of zero, uh, when our indicator is at that black line, it says that we're growing around the trend rate of growth. The blue line up there is a three-month moving average. So uh, it's hard to see, given this, the way the, the logistics of the room are, but uh, through the entire second quarter, we were well below zero. So in my remarks that I was making publicly, I was talking about a number that was going to be south of, of 2%. Uh, uh, and I was a little surprised by exactly how weak it came in, but I certainly was not expecting one higher. I will also highlight that we have a little bit of a test for this one, because most of the current now castings are suggesting a number close to 3% for the third quarter. Uh, the July and August CFNAI uh, averaged out with the June value is right now just below zero, suggesting a number that might be closer to 2%. We'll have to wait to see what the September CFNAI is, but uh, certainly I'm still thinking that we might be looking at a softer number in the third quarter than some of the now castings, but still better than what we've seen in the last three quarters. Um, Another good use of this indicator is a, is a sense of recession. You know, we're in the eighth year of our econo economic expansion in the U.S., fourth longest expansion that we've seen in U.S. history. Uh, his historically, since World War II, we've lasted about five years. So this one's getting a little long in the tooth. Uh, and yet people talk about, well, aren't we due for a recession? Uh, not that that's how recessions happen, as we all know. We ta it takes some kind of economic shock bad fiscal, bad monetary policy, bad uh, events in the world. Um, but you can see right now we are uh, far away from that range of that minus 0 0.7 to minus 1.3, where historically uh, our CFNEI needs to be in order for us to see actual declines in economic activity. So here's another way of presenting some of the information that Anthony shared. Uh, the red dots there are the midpoint estimates of the 17 policymakers uh, that are currently uh, are performing on the uh, uh, summary of economic projections for the FOMC. And what you can see is that going all the way out till 2019, it's a growth rate that is right around trend. So uh, it is really not much different than what we have seen uh, over the past 
uh, seven years. And, and to kind of illustrate this challenge of, of a growth coming out of a financial crisis, here is a cycle chart for a couple of our previous deep downturns, the mid-70s, the early 80s. And in particular, the top line there, the brown line, is the, is the early 80s, where over the same period of time, our economic output rose by over 35%. That's a remarkable increase in, in output. Averages out to uh, you know well over four percent. The mid seventies, same thing. And in back then, we thought trend growth in the U.S. was around three percent. So we exceed a trend for many many years by over a percentage point. Uh, and that was again really removed the slack out of the economy. The current situation in blue. You know, U.S. GDP is higher than ever before, but the average has turned out to be just 2.1%, barely over what we regard as trend growth for the U.S. economy. So it has been a very slow removal of slack in our economy, even as we enter the eighth year. Uh, almost every real sector we have in the economy still has room to expand without adding any additional capacity. Uh, so there is still slack almost in every industry. The automotive is probably the strongest sector. Um, employment, there's good news and bad news. Uh, the, some good news is the fact that uh, our growth rate has been pretty strong at close to or just under 2%. We had a 2.4 million jobs. This is more than double what we think trend growth is for the U.S. labor market. And that consecutive red bars over there is a, is a record of, of gains uh, consecutively. Uh, add them all up and you got 15 million workers, lots of workers added. And you know you hear in you know uh, certain people talk about those, but it's not being fair if you ignore that thing called the Great Recession when we lost 8.7 million workers. On a net basis, we're a little over six million workers ahead of where we are were in 2007. And given the fact that we should be adding about a, a little over a million workers a year, our view of trend employment growth is probably around 80,000 a month. Uh, that says that a million workers a year, we have 2008, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, nine years. So we should be talking about net nine million jobs added, not the six plus million jobs that we have. So uh, even this indicator, again, overall has some slack in it. That being said, the unemployment rate is at 4.9% a rate that we think of as a natural rate of unemployment, but for a whole host of other indicators that uh, 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 Anthony got into, uh, there's reasons to say that this is not the best indicator of whether we're at a normal level. In fact, if you asked most Americans, as I typically do in my remarks, virtually no one believes that we have a normal labor market yet. But I do believe we're getting very close to getting to that point. Uh, Anthony mentioned about uh, uh, the wage gains. You know, yes, this is the em uh, uh, Employment Cost Index series. Uh, the red line there is benefits, the, the green line is wages. It was really going nowhere for a very long time period. There's some hopefulness there that we are seeing some wage pressure. And in fact, uh, hope, hopefully, I don't know if, if Anthony agrees with me, but we're actually optimistic for wage increases. Uh, the labor share of our economy has suffered uh, over the last 10 years. Uh, it, is, it is due for a rever reversion to its mean. Uh, and I think a lot of the frustration that's being espoused in the U.S. is in part due to the fact that we haven't seen any real gains in wages. So uh, we are, my view is, the Fed is agnostic when it comes to income growth, whether it's on the capital side, whether it's on the labor side. So this, I think, is, a, is part of our virtuous cycle to see it move back. The unemployment rates are expected to remain at these levels. You've got trend growth. Shouldn't change your unemployment rates very much at all. Uh, I think this chart really illustrates one of the great issues and, and, and discussions that uh, we need to be thinking about at the U.S. is that this five-year average of our productivity growth, as you can see, has really come down. What we would previously regard as a growth rate of around one to one and a quarter percent, add to that the labor force growth of 0.8 percent, that's how you come up with this 1.7 to 2.0. Oh. Currently, uh, or at least over the last five years, our productivity growth has averaged half a percent. Given that this is our direct link to improve living standards, this is of great concern. 
The question is why? Why has it been so weak? Um, some of it has to do with these demographic issues, perhaps, but I think it's also, as, as uh, Anthony mentioned, not helpful that we have seen very poor performance on the investment side. Um, so you look at the last three quarters and we've seen declines each and every one of those quarters. And I think a lot of this is the fact that uh, you have seen uh, relatively modest growth in the U.S. Businesses concerned about the outlook have been able to achieve that modest increase of, of, of GDP by hiring more people. Where we have much more flexible labor markets than you have in Europe so that if something goes bad, they just shed the workers. Whereas if you bought a piece of machinery, you know, that piece of machinery uh, you're stuck with. It's also much more electronic in terms of its computers and stuff. It's, it's, it's wearing out much more quickly than historical type of machinery. So businesses have been hesitant to expand capacity by as many new machines. Hopefully a tighter labor market might alter this equation. As labor becomes more expensive, they actually might begin to pull the trigger and, and buy more machines. So uh, when we look at our, our top uh, indicator, the personal consumption expenditure price index for inflation, uh, you know, it's running at around 1% uh, in, in the US. This is well below our target of 2%, which we have for the top line PCE. Uh, we're ultimately responsible for all measures of inflation. But of course, largely this weakness uh, was driven down by very low energy prices. Uh, and, you know, we see it also for natural gas prices as well. So we have these two energy sectors that have been quite weak. This is a benefit to the U.S. Uh, even though our energy sector has expanded in its capabilities and those industries are suffering, and it's, again, hurting our investment to some degree, we still import 30% of our energy needs. So that's less money that we're sending out to other countries to purchase this energy, and that is allowed to remain in the U.S. As an example, you look at the spend by consumers on energy goods and services in the US. This is filling up your vehicles, it's paying your heating bill, paying your electric bill. It is four cents out of every dollar spent currently. And when you look at what it has averaged going back to 1960, that green line, it was over six cents. So this is a huge savings to the consumer that they can spend on other goods and services. But even removing the food and energy sector, uh, that path of inflation appears to be relatively stable. We don't see uh, much inflationary pressure uh, that has been taking place. What is expected? Well, the most recent uh, summary of economic projections in September uh, suggested that we'll be seeing some marked increases beginning next year. I think in large part it's the uh, adjustment with energy prices. Those are expected to move a bit higher. So it's actually push, pushing our top line uh, indicator, which we are, which is our target indicator, closer to 2%. And we kind of maintain that level uh, edging higher through 2019. The underlying rate of inflation uh, takes a little bit longer to adjust, uh, but also reaches that roughly 2% uh, by 2019. This is an impossible chart to see. I just advise you when you check out the slides uh, online. What it's in essence showing is the blue chip forecast for growth around the world. And as much as I might be saying that U.S. growth has been trend-like and not impressive, we are the, the North American region, so Mexico, Canada, and the U.S., uh, is among the strongest regions in the world. That is not bragging about the U.S. It's more of a sorry state of the rest of the world. You look at European growth and the blue chip expectations is for growth in the European market as being a full percentage point less than the, than the US for next year. You look at uh, uh, Japan's growth at less than a percent. Uh, the emerging economies are still struggling, especially you look at uh, uh, your Russia and, your, and, your, and Brazil uh, with the energy crisis affecting them. You look at uh, China's growth, if you can even believe their statistics, uh, which, are, which is slow. Uh, India is about the only emerging economy that seems to be holding its own. Another chart to kind of illustrate this weakness around the world is the purchasing managers index. So uh, the top line is the globe, and the globe is in that uh, ye yellow color. It's, uh, it's flat. The U.S. is right below that. We're actually a little bit better, but you'll notice that no country uh, of this reported purchasing managers index is in the green. 
which would be above trend growth. Uh, this weakness exists all around the world. One last indicator to suggest this trade issue uh, is the fact that the Baltic Dry Index uh, remains very low. Uh, which again is the cost of, of getting a freighter to move your goods around the world. There's just uh, little demand driving these prices. Um, so one of the challenges that has slowed the U.S. economy was a strengthening currency, which largely had to do with more aggressive monetary policy taking place around the world. Uh, it surged by nearly 20% in real terms, pulled back this year by about 4%. The dollar is still all in all quite strong. Uh, this has hurt our ability of selling our goods to uh, foreign consumers, and you can see that it basically has taken our manufacturing growth and brought it to basically zero. It's not our manufacturing sector is not in a recession; it's not collapsed, but we have no growth happening at this point. Um, what is expected? Improvement, uh, better improvement in the second half of the year is expected. Next year growth around 2.3 percent, but still. Next year's growth is below the trend for manufacturing. The headwinds of that strong currency still impacting our ability of, of selling goods. So probability of a recession, uh, this is the survey of professional forecasters, uh, the six month or two quarter outlook. And you know it's moved up a bit largely with regard to some of these international financial issues, but still remains all in all quite low uh, in terms of, of concern two quarters out. Another indicator I like to look at is the credit spread between the worst corporations, which are called the high yield or junk bond type of issuers, uh, and the best corporate uh, issuances of corporate AAA. And the credit spread, as you can see, really began to move higher at the end of last year, again, reflecting all of this international turmoil that began, especially during the summer. But as you can see, it has really scaled back ever since and continues to kind of uh, move lower. Uh, again, that to me is an indication of, of less risk of, of a recession, uh, at least by, by these financial uh, market indicators. So let's finish up by talking about uh, Fed policy. So the Fed, after seven years, finally increased interest rates by 25 basis points last December. I can share with you that the Chicago view uh, was that it was not needed. Um, uh, but one of our other, we lost that argument, obviously. Uh, the second argument we made was that if we're going to increase interest rates, we should be very circumspect. We should be very cautious with, with uh, going up very quickly. This is unusual for the Fed. Because normally when the Fed makes a determination that it is time to remove the punch bowl from the party, we take it out of the room. We don't let people keep taking scoops out of it as we're walking out the door. Um, so we normally increase each and every meeting, 25 basis points, 50 basis points, to get it up to our neutral level of policy. The very fact that in December, the Fed said that we were going to be increasing interest rates by 100 basis points this year, that would be suggestive of, if you do 25 basis points moves, four moves in the eight meetings that we have. In other words, one every other meeting. That's unusual in and of itself. Well, we just concluded our sixth meeting of the year, and we didn't increase interest rates yet. You know? So what was that necessary to have done what we did in December? I leave it to you. you I gave you my view and the Chicago Fed view. Um, with regard to the outlook, interestingly, uh, as Anthony mentioned, uh, the FOMC is suggesting of the remaining two meetings, we're, if you were likely to have one rate move going up. Again, as, as Anthony made clear, uh, each of these meetings are live. We, we, this is our best guess of what's likely to happen as of September. As incoming data changes, we will change our views. You know, and that's not being irrational. That's just being, you know, observant for the data. You know, when the information changes, we can change our mind. You know, what would you do? Would you just stick with whatever decision you made without the information being taken into account? Next year, interestingly, only two interest rate moves. So now we're, the Fed is saying that by the end of next year, we're only going to have three interest rate moves compared to when in December we said we were going to have four this year. So again, a much slower pace of policy accommodation removal. Finally, by 2019, we get just below the target of what is viewed as neutral. 
uh, something around 27 to 30. Um, so the way we should be thinking about this and the way we want people to think about this is clearly that the Fed is not putting the brakes on the economy. The Fed is basically taking our foot off of the accelerator. We have been assisting the economy throughout this period. We'll continue to assist the economy, but the assistance will be moderating as we move through 2019. Um, so basically some summary slides here points that's uh, you can read those on your own a couple of our websites uh, if you want to read Charlie's speech which he'll give in two days just go to the Chicago Fed website there and you'll be able to get that the SCP if you're interested in further details available at federalreserve.gov so thank you very much and I look forward to your questions please we have time for about uh, 15 minutes of questions uh, does anybody in the audience have a question Please Hello. Good morning. Now, I was wondering. You, you comment on, on on energy. I was wondering if you if you have a sense of the effects on the positive side or on on points on GDP that lower current energy prices are giving, but also on the other side. No. So, how much of the positive effects from investments and indirect effects of the shale and uh, oil and, and gas boom? has retracted and what would be the net outcome in, in, in GDP points? Yeah, so let me, let me just deal with the, the top line value. I don't know if Anthony, if you have, uh, Anthony's uh, Dallas Fed is the expert on energy. Uh, in fact, uh, our colleague who works there, uh, Minay Giselle, uh, uh, is just a phenomenal person to talk about uh, energy. But with regard to the top line, we used to talk about that for every $10 reduction in the price of oil, that could add a couple of tenths to GDP growth, uh, you know, over some period of time. Uh, clearly, this this this, this uh, view has been modified, given that we are now a lot much bigger energy producer ourselves. Uh, you go back before the shale revolution; we were importing about 60% of our energy needs. We've cut that in half. Uh, so. A ballpark figure would say you should cut that roughly in half. So we think of a tenth or so is the net positive uh, for every $10. So we've seen a collapse of energy prices by $50, $60 a barrel. Uh, so that has probably pushed us along a little bit by maybe as much as half a percent. But again, probably over a few years. Uh, that being said, uh, given the magnitude of the drop, probably has some impacts on our economy in that in that investment side that's probably much more negative than if it only had dropped by just uh, you know twenty dollars or thirty dollars uh, it probably would not have disrupted as much of the production as it as it as it has so you know that uh, net gain probably would be even smaller because of that I agree um, the expectation was on net, the fall in energy prices would be good for the U.S. economy, so consumers would have more money in their pockets. We knew that for some um, sectors of the economy, the effect on investment would be negative, and, the, and those effects would be felt very quickly or fairly quickly. Uh, we've seen they've been, those effects are being felt very, very quickly. So on the energy sector, they've responded very quickly in terms of cutting back investment to the fall in oil and, energy, uh, oil and gas prices. But we thought there would be more investment in other sectors because obviously energy is an input and you've, your costs have gone down, so output would go up. So I would say I agree with uh, Bill that we thought the effects, the positive effects of energy on the economy were smaller than in the past. I think now we'd say they're even smaller than we thought. For example, there's a, a good paper by Killian and Burmeister in the most recent book, Brookings papers on economic activity where they talk about these effects. In, um, in the case of um, energy suppliers in Texas, obviously, you know, shale gas is the elasticity of response or the responsiveness of energy suppliers to changes in energy price is far greater now than in the past. They're extremely responsive. Their costs have fallen. Energy producers, their costs have probably fallen 40 to 50% in the past couple of years. 
And in terms of the productivity of a well, obviously they're choosing better wells, and they're much more careful. But the, the output from a typical uh, well has gone up maybe 40% or something like that as well. Going forward, we've heard about OPEC possibly um, cutting back, attempting to cut uh, oil production. Well, OPEC is a much smaller share of the world market. And um, a lot of US oil producers have these so-called ducks, drilled but uncompleted wells. So they are wells that they can bring into production very quickly. So I suspect that the effect of OPEC on oil prices, their effect of uh, their attempt to drive up oil prices won't be very successful. US shale producers are the marginal producers and their response is very quick to situations like this. Do you have any other questions? Right here, ask. Thank you. Thank you for the two presentations. So, uh, William, you, you were very clear about uh, uh, the very weak performance of investment in the U.S. I'm afraid this is true everywhere else as well, mm -hmm. and, and even the, the situation is more worrisome in, in Europe. Uh, uh, I mean, given this uh, state of affairs about uh, private investment, what do, what do you think about uh, this ongoing debate about uh, the need or the convenience to foster public investment in, in, in infrastructures? And, and maybe related to this, uh, you, Anthony, mentioned in your very last slide, if I remember well, that some sensible supply side uh, policies were needed also in the US. I mean, here in Europe, we know that we are talking ev I mean, every single day about uh, the need of implementing supply side uh, policies. But I was a little bit curious of seeing a similar uh, message for the, for the US as well. I wonder whether you can uh, elaborate on this. Thank you. Well, everyone agrees we uh, should see more investment in infrastructure, but that's not sufficient in itself. So there's, in terms of the dyna how dynamic the US economy is and um, the low level of startups, the factors big gaps between the most productive and the least productive firms and the slow reallocation of, of resources amongst firms. Um, there's talk about increasing competition in the US. So lower levels of regulation, reducing the, um, well, reforming patents. There's too much rent seeking on the patent side. There's talk about uh, reducing licensing restrictions, which are basically barriers to entry in a lot of professions. So coming from Europe, I was sort of dumbfounded by how many restrictions there are in some professions in the US. There's talk about uh, significant tax reform, uh, federal, greater federal assistance for research and development that's been cut back in recent years and investment in skills. A lot of the things that you talk about in Europe, but uh, it's sort of unusual that we're talking about them in the US. Uh, I, I agree. I think we uh, uh, fiscal stimulus has been less helpful in the U.S. over the past few years. Um, you generally do not hear people from the Fed making much noise about that. Uh, I think you need to understand the fact that, uh, you know, we basically have uh, an agreement that we don't generally wade into giving recommendations of the appropriate fiscal policy level. Uh, and then at the same time, we don't appreciate when the fiscal side tries to tell us, uh, you know, what, what proper monetary policy is, um, and, and that trying to maintain that Federal Reserve independence. Harry, one last quick question, I'm sorry. Anthony, you mentioned the Brookings Institute this morning. This morning's Financial Times, they claim that the world economy is in a morass, especially emerging markets are horrendous. Emerging market opinion, please? What do you think about them? Well, I would just bad say as, bad as bad as they think it is. I don't know. I don't know how well. They, I don't know their view of how bad it is. As I shared uh, with regard to the blue chip, uh, it is. It is. We, we can't. We're not, we're not seeing any any hope with regard to these economies growing very rapidly. Um, the only one again that seems to be the most stable stable is is India. But the Indies right now ex experiencing quite a bit of changes with regard to both their government as well as with regard to the central bank. So we'll see if they can continue. Blue chip seems to be suggesting that there's no reason to think otherwise. One more, Michael. I have one more. 
I'm sorry, no bike. Um, traditionally, the LEI has to fall negative before eight, at least eight months after that before an recession happens. Looks like it could be at least two years for the next recession. Is that a possibility we can go another two or three years and no recession in this economy? Fed is saying we're going to go all the way to 2019 without a recession. That's two years. That's good. Okay. Yeah. Good to hear that. All right. Uh, we're going to try to stay on schedule. Okay, as my role as a moderator, actually, I'm just going to introduce the speakers and let them have the time. Uh, uh, now we're going to move on to Europe, and we'll have two speakers from, from the peninsula speak on Europe. Uh, first, Oscar. Oscar Arte is Associate General Direct, uh, Social Director General of Economics uh, and Research at the Bank of Spain. of Spain. His career has been at the Bank of Spain in forecasting and, and also at the... Um, what is it, the, the Securities Market uh, uh, Commission. Uh, he's, uh, he's a real expert on what's going on in, in, with, the, with monetary policy because he's also served uh, there as well. Uh, on the other hand, we're going to have somebody from the private sector, which is Jose Brandao de Brito, and he's actually a chief economist from Millennium, right? Uh, his experience, his work at the Bank, de, Bank of Portugal, right, in, in the past, and he's also been a member, and I have to read this, I can't remember, the Monetary Authority of Macau, which actually sounds very interesting, I didn't know. So please, Oscar. Thank you very much, uh, Manuel. Uh, thanks to the organizers for, uh, for inviting me. Let me start, can I, can I use the uh, Take point, it. maybe? Does it work? Okay, let me... Uh, uh, start with the usual disclaimer. What I'm saying here is just uh, my ideas and not necessarily those of uh, Bank of Spain or the Euro system. I will I will uh, talk today about uh, a very topical issue these days here in Europe, uh, which uh, essentially has to do with uh, the appropriate uh, policy mix. Uh, for, for good or for bad, uh, here in, in, in Europe, uh, perhaps contrary to what uh, uh, William said before, for the, for the US, uh, we are perhaps a little bit more inclined to talk about uh, uh, policies that uh, do not fall strictly within our uh, mandate, understood in a narrow sense. And today, actually, I'm, I'm going to talk a little bit about uh, uh, fiscal and uh, fiscal policy, monetary policy, and uh, structural reforms as well. Uh, I will, in particular, reflect on two very closely connected ideas. One is more on the on the on the positive side, uh, and on the other is more on the on the normative or on the uh, policy side. So the first one, uh, the first idea I want to convey today uh, is the following. Um, in my view, uh, some of the factors that characterize the current macrofinancial landscape of the euro area, including the zero lower bound, low inflation, weak and fragile growth, the leveraging in some parts of, of the euro area, call for an effective utilization of available policy space. And by policy space, I, I, I mean uh, potential space on the monetary policy side, on the fiscal policy side, and on the supply side uh, policies. In particular, I will elaborate uh, a little bit on this uh, one minute uh, uh, later. I think there are room for exploiting some policy synergies and some positive uh, spillovers across countries in the euro area. However, having said this, and this has to do more with the, with the normative uh, message, I think that some of the necessary conditions that are needed for an effective and, in particular, for a safe exploitation of these policy margins, specifically in the side of fiscal union, are to a large extent missing now in the, in the euro area. In particular, I think it is uh, uh, well accepted that uh, as of today, 
on the fiscal side, we lack, in general, we lack some uh, of the necessary credibility in terms of knowing beforehand long-term and medium-term fiscal strategies for uh, fiscal consolidation, in particular in those countries where long-term fiscal issues are uh, more pressing. So much effort has been put on uh, setting up rules and targets for uh, short-term fiscal policy, but still in many places in Europe, and not just at the level of the, of the, of the national authorities, but also at the level of the European Commission, we, we, I think we miss some elements for a genuine uh, uh, long-term fiscal strategy. Also, I think uh, we lack, uh, we lack uh, behind in terms of providing ourselves with some uh, policy tools and some instruments and some clear targets at the level of uh, the, euro, the euro area. So, uh, as I said in this slide, I think that uh, uh, we need more, much more clear advances in setting up a genuine set of tools and rules at the European level, especially in connection, not of course with monetary policy. Here, here uh, we are, uh, or oh, we can say we are done. Although uh, improvements are always possible, but in terms of uh, the other two legs of policy, fiscal policy and, and supply side policy, I think uh, the, the space for improving current things in the in the euro area is is still very high. So uh, I think that uh, somewhat. Uh, uh, Ironically, uh, the fact that uh, the central bank is right now constrained in the use of its uh, conventional tool, the nominal interest rate, in some sense works to enhance the effectiveness of fiscal policy. Why is that? Well, in normal times, when, when, the, when the central banker is out of the zero lower bound, an expansionary fiscal policy like uh, investment in, in infrastructures would typically raise inflation. And out of the zero lower bound, the central bank would normally react to these inflationary pressures by rising the nominal interest rate. And perhaps by rising the nominal interest rate more than one to one with respect to inflation. So at the end of the day, by rising indirectly the real interest rate. So in this way, in normal times, fiscal expansion typically crowds out private investment and private consumption by rising real interest rate. Now, in a situation like, like the current one in which uh, the European Central Bank essentially would like to have lower interest rates, but these are constrained by, uh, well, it's not the zero, but something close to zero lower bound, this last effect does not work anymore. And uh, in principle, uh, uh, the Central Bank would tolerate some, uh, some positive uh, inflation coming from uh, shocks in the economy, including some expansionary fiscal policy. In this case, fiscal policy that uh, rises growth in the short term and that rises inflation in the short term would typically help to reduce the real interest rate and through this channel to crowd in uh, private consumption and, and investment. So uh, in this sense, and there is a good uh, amount of uh, recent literature on, on, on this issue, some, some, some People like Olivier Blanchard and co-authors have been very clear on this very recently. We at the Bank of Spain has, have been working on, on, on these issues uh, as well. I think it's, at least from a theoretical point of view, from a macro model based point of view, I think it is clear that in the current juncture, uh, fiscal, uh, fiscal policy more uh, oriented towards growth will uh, be more effective not only in uh, the country that applies this kind of policy but also in the rest of the euro area okay so uh, uh, in short i think it is it is uh, we can say that uh, the current uh, situation of monetary policy makes fiscal policy uh, more effective than in normal times the other way around is 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 uh, is also uh is, is also here. I mean, uh, think that growth stimulating fiscal policy can provide in the current, circun in the current uh, circumstances a very valuable relief to monetary policy. In particular, fiscal policy that promotes growth and inflation in the short run may help the central banker by shortening the period over which its main instrument, the, zero, uh, the, the interest rate, is constrained by the zero bound. 
And this is, uh, I think this is particularly uh, valuable now because uh, whatever helps the central banker to shorten the situation of uh, uh, interest rate uh, uh, constraint is good for, uh, for uh, the effectiveness of, of monetary policy. I mean, it's uh, central bankers today, I mean, uh, one of the goals is, is to pave the way for an early normalization of their uh, monetary policy tools. And, and whatever helps in this, in this respect is, I think, welcome uh, from, the, from the side of uh, monetary policy. Also, uh, some people are increasingly concerned about uh, the potential negative effects that uh, very low interest rate uh, maintained for a too prolonged period of time may end up having on uh, financial uh, stability. So the shorter this current situation of negative rates and, 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 and uh, extraordinary uh, monetary policy measures is, is, is maintained, the better in terms of avoiding potential uh, side effects on uh, the side of uh, uh, financial stability. Uh, also, by now, we understand better that non-conventional monetary policy with pro-growth fiscal policy can also be very helpful to promote the implementation of structural reforms. And essentially, this is this is so because uh, both uh, expansionary fiscal policy and, of course, uh, non-conventional monetary policy help to counteract the short-term cost of structural reforms. As, as as you know, many of these structural reforms typically have some disinflationary effects in the short term that, in the current uh, in the current state of the economy, can be very damaging. Especially because uh, the central bank, as said before, cannot provide more monetary relief in, in, in face of uh, disinflationary, disinflationary shocks. Also, non-conventional non monetary policies that try to compress the whole yield curve and not just the, the close end are particularly helpful in increasing the net present value of structural reforms. I mean, many of these reforms, when one thinks about uh, reforms in the labor market and so on, typically deliver their full benefits in the long run. Non-conventional monetary policy, by lowering the stream of interest rates, help to feel stronger the benefits of these reforms even today. So in this sense, uh, and, and we have uh, also worked uh, quite a lot on these issues uh, at the Bank of Spain, I think there are good reasons to assume that now there are uh, important synergies between structural reforms and uh, fiscal and uh, monetary policy, which, by the way, is a message that uh, uh, Mario Draghi is stressing at the end of uh, his introductory statement every, every uh, governing council of the ECB. So, uh, so putting things together, I think we have arguments, you may, you may agree or not on them, but uh, I think that uh, the profession has come with some uh, well-rooted arguments uh, that uh, support this idea of uh, exploiting uh, the political, uh, the policy space at the euro area to improve uh, prospects on growth and inflation. But now the critical question is whether there is policy space in the euro area. My personal view on this, and I, I want to emphasize that this is, as said at the beginning, is, is only my personal view, is that there is some space in, in the euro area, especially in the fiscal and in the structural reform side. I don't think the monetary policy has uh, many degrees of freedom unexploited as of today, honestly. But there may be some space in, 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 in the fiscal and uh, supply side. Say, side. So where is the fiscal space? This is the next uh, the next question. I mean, we don't have a, a, a magic rule to say, well, this country or the other country has, has fiscal space. We do have some surely very imperfect measures of fiscal space, which are also very controversial within the euro area, at least within the euro system, as you can imagine, that essentially tell us that uh, there is some fiscal space in some of the core countries, Germany, maybe the Netherlands and some other uh, smaller core, core countries. Again, this is, this is not free of uh, controversy. At the same time, I think that uh, uh, to a lesser extent, 
but I think it is fair to think that there may be some fiscal space in some other countries, even outside the core of the euro area. I mean, the fact that, uh, for instance, if you think uh, of Spain for a second, I mean, the, the, the Spain has, has uh, um, uh, overshot it systematically over the last few years, the fiscal targets that were set by the European uh, authorities. I will not enter into the question whether this, uh, this was a good idea or not. I will refrain from, from thinking about that. But essentially, these deviations essentially tell us that exposed there was some fiscal margin even for countries like, like Spain. And this should bring to the table the issue of fiscal gradualism. I mean, the politicians have been discussing about uh, uh, the optimality of fiscal gradualism over the last uh, few years. And perhaps this is, it is also time for uh, academics and, and market analysts and so on to be a little bit uh, more reflective about the pros and cons of fiscal gradualism, and in particular how fiscal gradualism evolves with the state of the economy. Where is the space for, for structural reforms? I mean, for sure, in countries in the, in the periphery of the Euro area, and, and this is clearly the case of Spain, Italy, Portugal, and, and, and and some others, uh, uh, there must be a space for improving the efficiency of uh, markets and the efficiency of, of the economy at large. But I think that there must also be some uh, fiscal space in some core countries. The fact that investment is so low in countries like Germany tell us essentially that these economies are not sufficiently appealing, are not sufficiently attractive for business investment. So. Something wrong is going on, not just in the periphery of the euro area, but also in the core. And I, I simply do not accept the view that this cannot be improved. I, I guess there must be ways to improve the attractiveness of economies like the German one. And uh, perhaps the way to do that is to think about some uh, potential uh, structural reforms. I was very happy to hear that even in, in, in an economy which is usually thought to be very efficient as, as the US one, there is some space for, for further reforms. I'm sure there is some space for further reforms in the, in the core of the euro area. Now, a natural question that follows is uh, whether we have the necessary devices to exploit these available margins in policy in an effective and safe way. I think that, uh, at least focusing on the, on the fiscal side, I think that we don't have much margin to be exploited in an effective and especially in a safe way. I don't think that wherever the fiscal space is, can be exploited today in a safe way in the euro area. Why? Well, essentially, the arguments that I put forward earlier about positive synergies, positive spillovers between countries and between different uh, uh, policy tools rely very much on the idea that policy makers are fully credible. This is what we typically assume in our uh, macroeconomic models. Well, in reality, as I said at the very beginning, this, this assumption cannot always be taken as granted. Uh, in particular, uh, uh, the idea that uh, you can be more uh, gradual in your strategy of fiscal consolidation by spending a little bit more today, but committing to reduce public expenditure tomorrow is something that we know in reality is very hard to achieve. So uh, credibility is less than optimal, I think, at the level of, of the euro area. And as I said before, it's not only a problem that affects national authorities, in particular in connection with the lack of explicit and clear long-term fiscal strategies, but it's also an issue that affects the current uh, fiscal framework of uh, the European Commission. And this is something that uh, should be uh, strengthened before uh, we try to go further in terms of fiscal activism. So we have an issue with credibility, but we also uh, have an issue about uh, tools, institutions, and devices at the European level. I think that an approach, an European approach to policy space, which is absolutely necessary when talking about these, these issues, needs at the same time some 
European, genuine European uh, institutions, devices and approaches. And in particular, I think it is time to foster a swifter implementation of some risk mutualization instruments in, in, in the area of uh, the banking union. The third pillar of the banking union, as many of you know, is, is the setup, the full setup and the founding of deposit warranty schemes. We are in the process of doing that, but maybe it is time to accelerate this a little bit more. And perhaps it's also time to think about some mutual unemployment insurance mechanisms at the level of the euro area. These are, I think, some necessary ingredients to go further into this sort of fiscal activism, fix, fiscal activi activism sorry, at the level of uh, the euro area. We perhaps need also to uh, provide ourselves with truly independent and well-resourced well, well uh, fiscal independent uh, councils. I mean, the, the Fiscal Council has been set up at the level of, of, of the Euro of the European Union uh, recently. It is too early to know what is going to happen with this, but certainly we need this kind of a strong, independent, um, financially uh, uh, autonomous uh, institutions at the European level. One of the perhaps most effective ways to uh, allocate risk efficiently within a monetary union and even to reduce the aggregate level of risk at the level of a monetary union is by promoting financial integration. Uh, somewhat uh, surprising to, 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 to many, many, many of us, at least for me, is that uh, uh, after many years of uh, having a fully uh, uh, deployed uh, uh, single market union plus uh, single monetary union at least in the at the level of the euro area the level of the, the effective level of uh, market integration financial market integration in europe is still uh, pretty low i mean the the level of uh, cross border banking activity is still relatively low you don't we don't have genuine pan european financial institutions that operate in the most part of of, of the euro area and i think there is much benefit to be exploited in terms of risk, di risk diversification, liquidity externalities through the setup of pan-European market platforms. Uh, these days, many people are claiming uh, about a problem of asset scarcity, especially of safe assets scarcity in the uh, in the euro area. Uh, in the euro area, and I think again that there are ways to mitigate this problem of safe asset scarcities uh, in terms of call it euro bonds or similar i mean i think we already know that uh, good uh, good uh, a good pooling of assets and a good tranching of these assets is, is is a good technology theoretically to generate to increase the level of, of safe assets and this is something that uh, 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 european authorities could eventually think about and perhaps it is the time to, to set up some basic uh, aspects of a roadmap for a genuine fiscal union. Even though the urgency is not to uh, build up this fiscal union today, I don't, I don't think uh, the political conditions are satisfied to, to be very, very, uh, very aggressive on this now. But at least it would be welcome to have some clear idea of some of the basic aspects of this badly needed uh, European project. So to sum up, I think that uh, the combination of the previous ingredients, more credibility and uh, more and better genuine Euro European devices could allow for some better, uh, uh, a better policy mix at the, at the European level that would combine more active supply and demand policies However, exploiting this additional policy space without having these safety elements, without having more credibility on the side of, of, of fiscal policy, and without having the appropriate uh, institutions and rules at the European level, could lead us to some very unpleasant uh, outcomes. I will stop here. Thank you. Okay, so good morning all. It's a great pleasure to be here. Thank you for having me. Um, may I start with a provocation? 
Okay. Mm -hmm. So, I guess the, this conference um, theme is life after Brexit, right? Mm -hmm. And my provocation is that I don't, I, I think that uh, no speaker uh, spoke the word Brexit until now. Mm -hmm. And the, the reason I raise this, or I do this provocation, is because I guess it's a symptom that the elites, and by elites I mean politicians, academia, the mainstream media, you know, big business, uh, and so on, ignore, previously ignored the possibility of a Brexit, and is now ignoring um, the actual outcome of the referendum. So there's probably, uh, and that's, that's what I want to explore with you, um, there's probably something going on underneath um, that explains um, why we have in some instances a, a weird world today with uh, zero interest rates, 10, 10 trillion worth of um, sovereign government bonds with negative yields and a lot of other stuff. Um, and so basically that's, that's the theme I, I would like to address under uh, this title of the sleeping giant of uh, Western uh, politics. I'd like to start by uh, mentioning that um, for, for too long, Western voters uh, were deprived of, alterna of alternatives through which they could channel their views on supranational uh, matters. Uh, trade, immigration, uh, terrorism, you know, um, wars, whatever. And those supranational uh, matters, multiples, in, in the case of, of, of Europe, which has been, uh, of course, for, for the creation of the euro, has been um, outsourced to the ECB. So those supranational matters are incre increasingly important for the lives of, of um, ordinary U Europeans, and they don't have much of a way of um, saying and uh, having their views recognized by the polity. This situation has accumulated a lot of, a lot of pressure. Uh, so, um, and that's the idea behind this concept of, flips of the sleeping giant that I will uh, define a bit more um, concretely in a, in a minute or so. But this, this pressure uh, has accumulated uh, silently and we are now starting to see um, the, the, if the, the effects of, of this accumulated pressure um, and um, you, 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 you can see some cracks in the, in the political structure uh, that are appearing, I, I guess, that in Bre Brexit was uh, one manifestation of such, um, of such pressure. So what follows is necessarily an incomplete uh, reflection and it's probably, it's certainly incomplete and probably wrong, but I will nevertheless um, share with you. Okay, so, this uh, concept of, of the sleeping giant is something that I found a long time ago in a paper written in 2001, so a long time ago. And it basically defines this uh, sleeping giant thing as uh, the pro and anti-EU orientation. I'm, I'm reading now. Despite its apparent relevance for political behavior, constitutes something of a sleeping giant that has the potential, if awakened, to impel voters to political behavior that because of its ortho orthogonality with left-right orientations undercuts the basis for contemporary party mobilization in many, if not most, European uh, polities. That's, that's uh, a lot of uh, premonition, uh, writing that on 2001. And basically, I guess you can uh, generalize uh, and include the US, of course, I'm no expert in US politics, or European politics for that matter, but I, I guess it's, it's fair to uh, generalize this idea that the, the crux of uh, national politics in Western countries is slowly but surely moving or shifting from uh, left-right axis to a, a debate more centered on supranational issues, being it um, diplomatic or like NATO or, or um, trade agreements, f the, the fight against terrorism, migration, and so on. So the giant has awakened. Um, people start uh, started to voters, European voters, uh, start started to um, uh, started to uh, have they, their say in, in national politics. So basically, whether before uh, all 
all uh, elections was about national politics, whether they were for um, the national parliaments or for the European Parliament. And now it seems to be the, the other way around. I mean, all, all uh, or increasingly, national elections revolve ar around supranational and European issues. Uh, of course, there was Brexit, so there's another uh, manifestation of, of the giant uh, being awakened. Um, and if, if, you, if you look at the, that uh, poll tracker, uh, you can see how Donald Trump, which of course has, has a non, uh, I mean, has a different take on uh, several uh, important issues, uh, you, you can see that his popularity with uh, US voters has been increasing uh, for some time. Now, that thing that I mentioned about uh, the elites didn't paying too much attention or taking uh, uh, serious to the threat coming from you know, uh, from um, from the terrain, from 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 uh, um, the, the ordinary uh, citizen in, in Europe, it has to do with this thing. Uh, why why is it happening now? Why why is this the the, the giant? Uh, why has the giant um, awakened now? And in truth, uh, the motivations behind these political uh, shifts uh, they are they, they are not new. They are old. I mean, Migration in, in terrorism was was a, an issue, has been an issue in, in Europe at least for for a long time. Um, of course, there, there's, there's, there, there was this economic crisis, international economic crisis, but we know that, and I will try to show uh, a bit further with, with some concrete data that this this hollowing out of the middle class has started long before the the crisis, both in Europe and and the U.S. So. The motivations for this, uh, these changes, uh, these political changes in, in the Western world are not new. What is new, I guess, uh, is that now uh, voters have um, alternative political platforms uh, through which or they, that, that can harbor their views and their frustrations, by the way, um, in a way that it wasn't uh, possible five or ten years ago. So there was this clear market failure in, 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 the, in the realm of, in, in the market for political ideas that was filled with the, the emergence of these you know, anti-establishment uh, parties uh, all over Europe and uh, I guess in the person of, of candidate Donald Trump in, in the US. Now, Looking at um, some some data, uh, the problem with Europe. I was supposed to to, to uh, talk about Europe, but there's very uh, little data. The data that exists is, is short and is sparse. So um, I, I will do some. I will show you some data on on the US as well. But basically, my argument is that uh, these um, tectonic shifts in econo socio economic uh, indicators are are similar uh, in both sides of of the Atlantic. So if you take youth unemployment, the youth unemployment rate in the euro area, um, it, has, it has been coming down um, in Spain a lot as well. That's, that's, that's excellent. But in any case, it remains too high. So basically, it has been too high for, for too long, uh, which, which, you know, which makes uh, the future for the generation that has graduated uh, um, from university or has uh, lived, uh, le or have, has left uh, high school ten years ago, their their prospects are are quite poor on, on average, um, because of this uh, high uh, unemployment. There, there, there are a lot of uh, there are much more to, um, um, to the, the social economic problems that we have in Europe. Um, apart from unemployment, youth unemployment, but as I, as I said, I couldn't find any consistent data. So uh, I'll move on to other kind of indicators. And basically here, this is uh, taken from the Eurobarometer that and asks people what are the, the, the you know, their um, main worries um, about the EU. And as you can see, um, the economic situation and unemployment has been coming down and uh, immigration and terrorism have been you know, creeping up uh, for, for some time now and are now clearly the most um, distinct, distinctive uh, um, uh, worries of European uh, citizens. And why is this a problem? Because 
Europeans don't trust the EU to be able or competent to, to deal with uh, those issues. And you can see um, the, the outcome, the evolution of the outcome of this uh, very simple question, do you trust the European Union? And uh, it's, it's, it's on very low levels. And you can see that uh, if this is transposed into national politics, then you, you could see a lot of anti-Europe, um, anti-establishment um, uh, political parties making a good ground, uh, if not um, winning outright election, national elections. Sorry. And now this is, uh, we, we have uh, yields on 10-year government bond of, of Germany and Portugal. Uh, Portugal being, of course, uh, the grey and um, the, the, the red is, 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 is bonds, German bonds. And the, the sense is, that there's a sense here that the Eurozone or the uh, Europe doesn't uh, serve anyone anymore um, for, for savers because Germany or Germans are, are um, they save a lot and, and they get very low, uh, they get negative uh, yield on their, um, their most trusted and preferred um, saving assets. While the, the Portuguese, which, are, which have a lot of debt, both public and private, pay too high interest rates, or at least relative to other countries. And so um, Germans complain that uh, the periphery uh, is not fiscal respons fiscal responsible and so on, and uh, the periphery complains that uh, Germany is not spending uh, enough to stimulate the European economy. So there's a sense that the, 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 the EU project, the European project, is not serving no one anymore. Now, turning now to the U.S., all the data is taken uh, from a book by the, the American social scientist called Charles Murray, and the book is, is called um, Coming Apart, the State of White America, 1960-2010. Um, um, and, and basically, the, all, all this data is, is, is uh, very mainstream, is taken from the Bureau of Labor Statistics, either uh, the CPS, the current population survey, or um, the integrated public uh, micro, micro data series. So this is not something, some funny source. This is pre pretty much official kind of uh, data. And I would start by, by showing um, the, um, the trend uh, of median family income, real uh, income, uh, going from the 60s, 1959 to 2010, and what you can see is that in real terms, 50% uh, of the population had uh, uh, no gains or even a small, uh, gentle decline in their real uh, income. Only for the uh, the five rich, richest uh, or, or the, the five uh, higher um, earners in the U.S. Um, did they experience any any kind of uh, increase in their real um, income. And of course, the the, the one percent uh, got a lot of the the pie that was cooked uh, in, in in between. So um, you you can see how unsustainable politically this this might become, uh, basically because uh, five percent of of the population is getting most of the benefits of of, of growth. I'm not making any uh, judgment on whether this is fair or not. It's just saying that you, those are the things that brew uh, frustration and political um, uh, upheaval. Now, when, when you look at uh, this, by the way, this, uh, this pertains only to uh, white, uh, for, for, for reasons that I'm going to not, not, not to explain now, but it's, it's just for, for white people. It doesn't include any minority. Now, the, it's... Charles Murray basically um, created these two concepts of uh, a new upper class and a new uh, lower class. I'm not going to, to go into it, but basically uh, we, we can think about uh, we can think of of the, of the upper class as people with the college degrees that uh, perform uh, some you know, sophisticated professions like um, academics, um, working in the media, engineers, scientists, uh, lawyers, uh, managers, so on. And, and, and lower class, they don't have any college degree and they perform uh, basically less sophisticated professions like plumbers, electricians, um, production line, um, and industry, and, and so on. Okay, so when, when, you, when you look at uh, 
this this graph, for example, you, you can see that um, you, you can see that whereas uh, the upper class maintains um, ma maintains a, a, um, a life profile that hasn't changed for a long time, so basically they uh, kept on doing the same things and behaving in the same thing and having the same kind of benefits from uh, from uh, society when you look at um, the lower class you can see you can see uh, how you know bad uh, in, in this case uh, things have turned out on on a on a social kind of way so basically this uh, a lot of a lot of white adult men living um, on their partners or mothers or sisters or or whatever and so they cannot make a living from for themselves and of course not for any uh, prospective family that they might be contemplating uh, start forming. Um, you can see other social, uh, socially worrying indicators um, at the level of, of uh, you know, child, uh, child's um, education and bringing up. Uh, you can see that in the upper class um, nothing much changed in terms of um, the, the, the social status of uh, child up upbringing, whereas in the lower class it has been, um, you know, it has been worsening, and and and, and we and and uh, it's it's pretty clear now that uh, children that um, emanate from um, from uh, um, th that live with both parents, they have much better prospects in terms of um, education and earnings than. And, and also other social indicators like crime and so on, then have people or children that uh, don't live, that don't, that they, that aren't um, educated by both parents, biological parents. Um, well, this is prisoners per uh, 100,000 population, and you can see the same kind of thing. Okay. So I, I think that even though I don't have actual data, I think that the same kind of social phenomena is and social and economic phenomena is, is happening in Europe as well. So the the issue is uh, what now? What's going to happen? And I guess that um, the, the anti-establishment sentiment is is, is growing uh, fast. Uh, it's becoming it's it's becoming predominant in in a lot of uh, uh, electoral. Uh, um, districts and they will they they and that and, and and that thing will turn out to be important in in elections and might uh, it might swing completely the way uh, policy is um, um, think of and implemented there is worrying sign that uh, the people the average citizen do not pay any attention anymore to what elites say I mean they just uh, we, we saw with, with Brexit that there was a lot of scaremongering. Uh, there was, um, you know, most people uh, from the elite were, were saying that would be disastrous for for um, for UK to to leave the uh, European Union, and and still uh, voters voted for for Brexit. Uh, and so the thing is, the risk is that we, we might have we might have uh, some other um, countries leaving um, the European Union, or or any any other kind of um, dysfunctioning or dysfunction or any any any, any kind of, of political phenomena that could uh, hurt the European project so we, you, we have we have uh, someone that wrote we might have uh, the Portugal uh, Italy a checkout and out uh, Austria uh, Finnish um, by GM and so on it looks like only Romania will stay <coughs> Well, should we worry? Of course, when the, this, this is taken from uh, this poem, this very famous poem by William Butler Yeats, the Second Coming, and when when there's uh, this void, uh, the transition might not go well. And history shows that some, sometimes when uh, the center cannot hold the best, like all conviction, and the words are full of passion and intensity, we know we know that uh, we just have to go to the 20th century to see. To see how uh, that might um, turn out, um, but that's in a way there's of course risks. But when you look at uh, life after Brexit in the UK, you can see that um, basically 
nothing much spectacular uh, happened. I mean, uh, it could be it could, it could be worse. You, you see, uh, the, the, the main equity uh, index there reco fully recovering from uh, the lows of the, the post referendum. Cable. Okay, thanks. It's me saying I'm done. <laughs> okay. Um, okay, business confidence has recovered as well. Um, the news that the housing market would be dead the day after Brexit was clearly exaggerated. You can see that house prices have fallen very, very gently, um, and and so and so it was not a, a it was not a, a, a catastrophe. Now. Um, I'd like to, to end on, a, on an optimistic uh, note uh, to say that um, maybe, maybe this unraveling of these supranational um, institutions, maybe uh, this devolution of the policy making uh, center from supranational institutions towards, um, towards the, um, the national level, maybe it's not a coincidence. I mean, m maybe it's a, a, a happy coincidence, maybe it's some divine. Uh, cooked uh, coincidence, and the reason why I, I, I say so is because you can see that m most of the problems have to do with, with the fact that uh, economic growth is lower, and is lower because productivity is lower. But the, that uh, that that is for the U.S. Uh, as Bill has already uh, shown this graph, but I, I took 10-year moving average rather than f his five years, and what we can see I is that in fact, uh, as the pie shrinks, or uh, if the pie doesn't grow as much, there will be uh, I mean, the, the, tide, the, the tide will not uh, uh, rise sufficiently to lift our, all boats, and that creates uh, social and political um, uh, tensions. The thing is, that the, I think that we, we're probably on the verge of uh, a forced industrial revolution based on advanced uh, robots and 3D printing, and that will, in a, in a way, and of course, I, I don't have time to elaborate on this, but it will basically... Uh, um, Creates a, a, a trend that will that we by which globalism will give way to localism um, because basically production labor costs or lower labor costs won't be the main um, location driver for uh, for economic uh, um, um, production or economic activity and so there will be basically manufacturing will be coming home into uh, back to the western uh, countries and um, has. The, the, the political power also comes from the supranational level into the national level. I guess that will be um, that will work all right. And uh, all the uh, at that. Thank you. Okay, Utsin. Let's have just a couple of quick questions uh, so we can have a few minutes of break before the next session. If you, anybody has a question, please raise your hand or just go ahead. Please go ahead. Yeah, just a quick question. We talked about uh, Germany and uh, the demand crisis. No, so I was wondering if it's not really, I mean, we're trying to solve things with the supply side, and isn't this a demand crisis? Don't we need, isn't this debt-based uh, model exhausted? Don't we need to change the model to increase income and reduce uh, profits on companies? Is there a debate on the central banks about uh, changing the model, or are we just trying to solve things, continuing as it is? Well, uh, thanks for the question. I, I, I would say that uh, more on uh, thinking about the potential change of uh, of model, whatever the model means in this in this setup. Uh, I can talk of from my own experience. Uh, there is some discussion on um, well, how to understand better the interaction between demand and supply policies upon the, uh, I would say, rather strong assumption or even uh, after recognizing that uh, both sides are needed. I mean, I think there is no doubt that uh, in the short term, in order to facilitate uh, the recover of weak aggregate demand and prices, we need to push aggregate demand up. And th this is certainly what uh, the monetary policy has been doing for, for some years now. But at the same time, I think it's it's uh, absolutely necessary to 
increase the efficiency of some critical markets, the labor market and some product and services market in some parts of uh, of the euro of the euro area. Uh, and the later is good not just in the long run, where uh, this is typically uh, the time horizon where, as I said before, these kind of reforms typically deliver their benefits. But I think uh, an interesting debate is, is unfolding on the need of doing this now, okay? in the sense that enhancing the effectiveness, enhancing the competitiveness of our economies will not only be good in the distant future, but through income and expectation effects, it can be also positive in the current uh, setup. And one of the core points of my previous argument is that precisely in a situation that we would qualify as, as, as a very challenging one with weak growth, uh, monetary policy being constrained by the, by the zero lower bound on interest rates, uh, private deleveraging and folding in some parts of the, of the euro area and so, and so on and so forth, there is ample space for positive interaction, for synergies or positive externalities between different uh, policy instruments, both on the side of uh, demand uh, policies and on structural reforms. Now the issue of debt, uh, I, 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 I don't, I, I, honestly, I don't uh, uh, have clear ideas about what uh, a debt-based model uh, means exactly. But I think that in any case, uh, the existence of high legacies of, of debt in some in some countries, and Spain is certainly one of them. Although there has been a an important progress on the leveraging on the side of both households and, and corporates is an element that has to play uh, has to play a role in our analysis. I mean, some of the transmission mechanisms of shocks and of policies, and in particular of monetary policies, are typically very much affected in the presence of private debt. And it is in this sense that I think that private debt must play a key role in in our analysis. Uh, Okay, I, I leave it here. Thank you. Yeah, one one comment on, on the fiscal space issue. I mean, fiscal space is, is wonderful, provided nobody cares about debt. Um, markets are now rightly not caring about debt because the ECB is out there buying everything that moves. But since we engage in this sort of a stealth transfer of solvency issues to the ECB, if people start caring about debt again, can this turn you know, relatively ugly? But my uh, question uh, really was for the, for our uh, U.S. Um, participants uh, to offer you know, uh, your view on on Brexit. What's your take? Is this the beginning of the unraveling of of Europe, or rather the chance to reset everything on a uh, sounder uh, footing? Uh, and finally, we have discussed a lot about you know, central banks' monetary policy. But at the end of the day, you know, of course, the ECB and the and the Fed were not the same in their, in their policies, but they're not that different at the end of the day. Where we were more radically different in Europe and the US was in fiscal policy and what we did with the banks. Whereas uh, the US was addressing that head on from the beginning with a forced recapitalization of the banks, we did nothing in Europe. So do you think we made just one policy mistake with engaging in aggressive uh, fiscal policy at the beginning or, or two policy mistakes? Uh, you know, given that we spent, for instance, the best part of last week wondering what you know, Deutsche Bank would go belly up. Thank you. In terms of in terms of Brexit, the UK is about eight percent of our trade. So uh, Europe is much more important. China is much more important. So the trade effects of Brexit are not all that great. The financial market effects, if they if it leads to contagion or something like that, yes the effects will be bigger. But we really haven't seen Brexit so far. Uh, the effects are going to be much greater in Europe, and it's, a lot of it has to do with passporting rights and those sort of issues. So for the US as a whole, it's, it's something we'd watch, but it's, I don't think it's going to be a major issue per se. Yeah, and uh, with regard to what I what I could add is, you know, the table I gave you with the blue chip forecast, the roughly 50 professional forecasters, they really uh, lowered growth aspects for for the UK for next year. It's down to 0.4 percent, so almost a growth recession 
uh, for, for the UK. Um, you know, financial markets reacted very violently initially, uh, but within a month came, came right back. I think still the concern out there is, as was mentioned, the contagion. You know, is this a signal of, 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 of the start of others maybe perhaps considering uh, leaving the EU or perhaps even the Eurozone? Uh, aspect. So I think that's the kind of uncertainty and, who, and you know, that's, that, that's the big risk that's out there. But at this point, uh, it, it seems to be fairly well contained. The collapse of the, or the, the reduction in the value of the, of the pound, probably going to lead to some tra greater trade. The real losers from the U.S. standpoint on this are those who establish facilities as a jump off point to bring goods into Europe. Um, and, and those are probably going to need to be relocated to the continent uh, if, they, if, if you want to conti continue that kind of a, of a organization. But otherwise, it's probably, as I agree with Anthony, not, not a big issue for the U.S. Okay, uh, how, how long break? Hmm? Yeah, why don't we, 15 minutes on the break. Start.